I feel like there's been this lull and they fired the GM and there was tons and tons and tons of thoughts. And it was Trey Living's coming in here and how much power does he have and what's the move going to be and blah, 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 blah. And now they're heading in the draft and it goes, yeah, they just changed their general manager and we're not really sure what the next change is going to be. And I started looking at stuff going, all right, so they're going to keep the coach. Their, their guy is talking about bringing back the core four. Yeah. Mm. If they're lucky to get them re-signed, that's... Yeah, so <laughs> I read something the other day where they went, oh, Toronto's willing to shop their first round pick. And I went, all right, yeah, but what's oh. the value of that, right? Like, 28th? It's the you get Rasmus Sandin. Yeah, that's... I, honestly, Rasmus Sandin's one of the best players that was picked in that range over, like, the last five years. Yeah. So, yeah, that's maybe the value of that pick. Let's just say the value of that pick is that Washington was willing to throw it in for Rasmus Sandin, who was the Leafs... Seventh ish defenseman yeah. last year who's young and still potentially has some upside. I'm just saying that the idea that all of a sudden this pick has transformed into a highly coveted item right. around the NHL feels like a little bit of a stretch. It's not Brett Pesci coming nah, back. It's, it's not. Yeah. I was like, they have Nick Robertson in there. I forgot about him. What if he became a player? Wouldn't that be fun? Well, here's the thing. This is where I'm going to start today. They might need him to. Oh, because as of right now, the top six isn't bad, right? Okay. Top six. Core four, yeah, right? Core, core Starting four, with that. Splash in Yarn Pretty, Croc and Yarn Croc another and player. Nice. nice. Oh, yeah, he's around. Right. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. Except for the point I made before the break was, you know, Nice got hurt playing, what, eight games? Seven games? Yeah. Yep. Brutal hockey. But it was yes. brutal hockey, but yeah. I'm just saying that he's 21 years old. Yeah. They sheltered him for a reason, and now all of a sudden he's being asked to play a full 82 in top six minutes, going, what, 16, 17 a night? Yeah, I mean, it's, such is life, though, of, sure. like, you become a hockey player. Sure, such is life. Just feels like a lot of reliance, given that. Can you tell me the only other Toronto Maple Leaf forward that was on the team last year in the playoffs that is currently with a contract in the bottom six? Uh, oh, boy. It's Sam Lafferty, bro. Okay. <laughs> yeah, pretty nice. Yeah. It's okay. Sam Lafferty, only making yeah. a million bucks. Guess who's after that? It's Pontus Holmberg, Nick Robertson, and uh, Bobby McMahon. That's how you're <laughs> filling out your roster as of this moment. And so here's the thing I've been just kind of sitting on yeah. that I wanted to bounce off you and sort of get into this stuff. Should we cover another team? Oh, I sorry. Wish okay. we... <laughs> sorry, I thought I didn't mean to preempt you. There. Honestly, Go ahead. <laughs> I, if they run it back, yes, because I don't know what to do during the 82 games. Really exciting stuff come playoff time. Yes. They run it back. Same thing as always. Yes. But yes, should we cover another team during the regular season if the <laughs> yeah. Leafs run it back? Absolutely, we should. Um, no question about it. So I think that we take too much sometimes from teams that win and you go, it's a copycat league. What can you learn? Yes. What can you learn? And yes. it's usually an exercise in futility. I remember the one year Pittsburgh won without defensemen and people went, hey, Pittsburgh didn't really have any like stud defensemen. This is my either. article today, by the way. Okay. Is right. that there's lots of ways to build a winner. Hey. Don't fall in love with the most recent champ. Okay. But what I will say is this one thing about the winner. Vegas, as much as Marsha show got hot. Mm-hmm. Vegas, as much as Mark Stone is an absolute stud at the very top who just does everything for a team and you watch him in the playoffs and you just get enamored by the way that he plays like a 200 foot game and can also score their team. Their identity was the team. And so the misfits were there. It was six guys that were cast offs from other groups and you go, all right, so it's only six guys from the original team, blah, blah, blah. They had a toss in goalie, but that was the feeling is like, interchangeable parts mm-hmm. that everybody owned a stake in this team. And maybe there was more stake for a guy like Marcia. So maybe there was more stake for a guy like Eichel who, you know, sacrificed his Buffalo legacy to make sure that he went somewhere else. Maybe there was more stake for Mark stone, a guy that kept getting close, but hadn't really been over the hump, but they were a team. Mm-hmm. And there was that, you know, musing by Elliot Friedman. And I, I, I hate, you know, trying to guess sort of what he said, but it was essentially the idea behind it is Toronto doesn't have regrets about having the core four, but they do wonder if it's like taken up too much oxygen and gotten too much attention about just being about these four players. And I can't help but feel like this off season, that would be more than ever. Like the idea that Matthews would get a new deal and that Nylander would get a new deal, that both of those guys would exercise even more power over the organization, that they would keep their head coach cost more against the cap. And then you go into an off season where you've got some real hurdles to jump with your cap space and a bottom six that you genuinely have to essentially fill out from scratch. To me, it's like that is the thing that has changed for me mm-hmm. is moving forward with this identity of four players. It's not about, hey, these guys stink or these guys are flawed or these guys are whatever. 
I mean, you can have your opinions on some of that stuff, but I think that the major thing to me about figuring it out is that having these mercenaries that fill out around four guys and trying to go into the postseason and have it feel like, you know, band of brothers like Vegas and chip on your shoulder identity Mm -hmm. and just depth and scoring. These four guys have proven at this point that they are not good enough as a four man unit to provide enough scoring just the four of them to win a Stanley cup with a bunch of bums. Mm -hmm. And I don't see a way after what we just saw with that team last year, where Toronto was going to now seemingly uh, be able to find a forward group that fills out around those guys. That's better. So I guess kind of just your thoughts on that and whether, Mm -hmm. yeah, you're starting to feel like maybe, you know, you're not going to win the core four trade. You're not going to win that outright. And people are going to look at it and go, wow, you trade Nylander for this. But do you have to make the, you know, lose the battle to win the war kind of thing. Yeah. That was another article I kind of wrote just the idea about how do you get different without getting worse? And yeah. then, cause there is some merit to just trying something else. I agree. You know, you trade, I think I had made the comment about it. Were you to trade Marner for Soros in Nashville? And all of a sudden you have a, you know, one of the best goalies in the league. You also, yeah. that frees up 6 million in cap space for the next two years to maybe it's Soros and Orlov or whatever. And all of a sudden you're different. I don't know if you're better, but you're different and you want to try something else. I, I'm of, of the same belief as you that I've seen enough from this core four group to believe that it it alone cannot be sort of the nucle, nuclear core that like powers a team through. My problem is when I look at Vegas, I don't just see a team, a universal team and everyone pull in the same direction as I see the best decor in the NHL. I see Petrangelo, Theodore, Hag, White Cloud, you know, whoever also was there. A couple. That's of, a really good point. A really good D. So I see... A D that is so solid that you get out of your end, you play in the other zone, you give the guys chances to succeed, and all of a sudden March or so overachieves or Stone gets a few extra or whatever it is, and they find a way. When I look at the Leafs this year, it's really hard. Like right now when I look at their roster, it's really hard for me to look at their decor and think they have a chance to win a cup, even a snowball's chance. Like Riley and Brody are your top two D-men, and Brody looked pretty bad in playoffs and isn't getting younger. So not feeling great about that. Jake McCabe, I really enjoy at $2 million salary. I'm yeah, great. But he's a two, three, like he's like a, not a two, three as in a number two second or three, or third pair, second guy. or third pairing guy. So like I came to grips with what he is over the course of the yeah. season. He ain't really moving the needle. He's helpful. Even though our boy McKee was like, is that what Bobby Orr looked like? I know. <laughs> well, we all had moments. He threw a couple of hits and yeah, it was like, just, Oh my God. Just, yeah. But every time just... he threw a hit, he lost his mind in the yeah, ensuing seconds. But uh, Lilligren then, okay, you know, okay, mm-hmm. fine. So, okay, Lilligren and, and uh, you know, McCabe and then Timmons, Brody, Ro- it's bad Bringing back now. Luke Shen and thinking that you're going to get yeah. the exact same result as you yeah. got this year, which kind of. You kinda... have to get appreciably better yeah. on the back end. You have to get a guy guy. Yeah. You know, if it is Brett Pesci from Carolina is the name I brought up before, but mm-hmm. like. So, yeah, when I look at the core four, I have not been a guy who's looked at them over the t- the years and said, trade Nylander for a D-man. That I've, their D has been fine enough for me. Mm-hmm. I just think it kind of falls apart when you lose Giordano, you lose Hall. It's just Dude, they're, I, they're in trouble there. I think that that, you know, that ties into the next part that I was going to go to, which is that the blue line's also not good enough either and yeah. that they still need to get off the Matt Murray money. But oh, can I just interrupt you for yeah. the, you know, you see everyone on Twitter being like, they don't need D they need goals. Their D is fine. You can get goals from the back yeah. end. You can break the puck up and help your forwards. As you we need, saw from Morgan Riley, you need better players on defense, whether you want to call them, you need D or not. You need better players on defense. But this is it. Is that why I've come to the conclusion of the core four thing needs to end is not for the intangible stuff that we try to guess about, right? Not yeah. about Marner putting the puck over the glass right. or whether the market pressure is too much for him, whether Matthews cares enough to be, you know, the blood soaked leader of a championship winner, whether Nylander can be consistent enough, blah, blah, blah. Like I don't care about that stuff in this conversation. I do. Obviously I have my opinions on these things, but what I'm really saying is that's like, man, how are you going to improve your blue line? How are you going to make sure that your goaltending is shored up? How are you going to make sure that you have spread out goal scoring from the rest of your bottom six, or at least somewhat of an identity other Mm. than 
Bobby McMahon and the Mercenary Boys around your forward group, like the top guys. six. I like them. Yeah, I like those guys too. But I guess what I don't <laughs> yeah. love is coming into the season where yeah. you might have a bottom four where it's Pontus Holmberg, Bobby McMahon. They're and... all your 12. Every guy is like, that's your 12 forward. I like McMahon as your 12th. I like yes. Holmberg as your 12th. I like it, Robertson as your 12th. Exactly. How are you going to make Maybe the pieces around? Well, the Robertson thing is... Robertson just feels destined as a guy who's not going to work out here and then go somewhere else and has one year where he pops for 30 goals and everyone goes, yeah, like (laughs) nuts about it. And then he ends up being just kind of like, yeah, whatever. That's a reasonable crystal ball take. Yeah. Yeah. So, but either way, it's like, that's it. What are you going to pull from? So your assets, if you're not talking about core four, you're going to have to trade somebody, right? Like someone has to get moved here. Because the well, free you have agent a market, a lot of open space. You got cap so money. What? You got space. So you need centers, right? Right now, after Stahl resigns and uh, Johansson gets traded, the best center on the market is Comfer. Like it's not enough. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's enough. And yeah. also, there's all this thought of you got to push Tavares to the wing, and I go, I agree, but I don't think you're doing it for Comfer. I also don't know about that. Like you know. He was a point per game guy last year. There's plenty of point per year guys who score 60 points. I think it's points really in, overstated. 60 points in 75 games as your second line center. Pretty good. Buddy, if if John Tavares made $8 million, you think we'd be having conversations no. about moving him off center? You're right. It's about money. It's about money, but also it's like you would love to have someone that if you're keeping Nylander, that you could play with Nylander outside of Tavares yeah. or with Marner, right? Like if you were really going to split these things up and mm-hmm. go, hey, how do we disperse the talent that we have? You would have just loved to have, I hate saying it, but like a Kadri where you could have gone, you know what, Marner and Kadri are going to play together and Tavares is going to anchor his own line. And maybe mm-hmm. at 11 million, it sucks that it's more of a checking line that they tried a couple of times, but he's supposed to score and provide depth down the lineup. And it is what it is. But yeah, just that's, that's where I'm at with this is I, I don't see a scenario where you're taking Lilligren or that first round pick or Nick Robertson and turning that into meaningful pieces Enough to really fix your team. Yeah, you're trading Dogecoin there. Yeah, That's it. There, now like, you're getting any real value back. I don't. I don't, I don't know what's coming back. It just feels like too many holes at this point. Yeah. And and I, I think it's interesting now looking back with some time and some space that Shanahan did hire Tree Living, and Tree Living's won trades before. You know, you go through it like the Dougie Hamilton trade. Like that was a good mm-hmm. one for him. He's had some solid hits in Calgary, but now you're basically bringing a guy in who is. Probably the biggest, he's not the biggest reason, but that trade is one of the biggest reasons if you're in the camp of don't trade one of these guys. Like the against, trade? Yes, because you're going. I don't think there's anybody who could have done better than what he did. I, no, I agree with that. Yeah. What I'm saying is in general, the yeah. principle of that trade, yes. the idea of trading a star player to for, get worse, <laughs> to get two <laughs> players to spread out the talent. Yeah. It could not have gone worse in in the little time that we have to judge off this what deal. What Huberto and Weger make combined a season now, like 16 mil or something like that? Yeah. Something gross. Yeah, that's, well, I guess that's the other part of it is if you're Toronto, you might not be <laughs> trading for that. But I do think that there's just always been the Carolina thing. I think you met, even talking about it with Pesci. Yeah. It just feels like there's something that those Willie. two teams with either Nylander or with Marner, one of those two guys yeah. with their surplus on the blue line, with the fact that they're still young, they've this got a Tusky ton of young stuff, guys. Right? As he's an analytics guy. These are analytics players. So then analytic your way into Mitch Marner or, or William Nylander, please. Because 100%. it just, you, you two feel like natural trade partners. They need another stud up front. They they've do. tried to run it out with their depth and the Nikas of the world as their top scorer from yeah. last year. It's not happening for you. And yes, you got hurt. And yes, Aho is going to come back and need a new contract. But they I just need keep someone lo- to score. I keep looking at those two teams and going, well, that's, I guess if you think need someone to score, then it's Nylander. Cause I was going to say that to me, I'm still hoping that you get off the Marner money. I did too. You know, I know that's uh, that would have been sacrilege to say a year ago or whatever, but no, I, know, during I, the middle I, of the season when he was the best player on the team, I, I think it's, I think it's the better thing for the the culture here, the direction, the whatever. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to make your team better there. And yeah, you can get a real D man out of them. Problem is Carolina is pretty smart. Yeah. You know, I don't think you're getting back. Why can't? But Trey Living has also a history of trading with Carolina. Yeah, does he? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what the, oh, the, the Hamilton. Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah. It's like he's actually dealt with that team before. Yeah. I think a couple of times, but it's just they yeah. might be a smart team, but they both team feel like groups that are at that inflection point, that tipping point yeah. of, hey, we're Carolina. We gotta do something. You, hey, both you guys been really good in the regular season. We get it. You guys both, are really. Both teams are looking to get different. Yep. You guys are awesome in the regular season, and Carolina is the team that has the depth and the blue line. 
And both teams have had the shaky goaltending, right? They both tried the Freddie Anderson thing, and it didn't work out for either team. They were like, all right. (laughs) All right. I guess we now know for sure that Freddie Anderson is not not the thing. But, yeah, yeah, uh, to me, I just look at them and I go, you're natural trading partners because I just don't see what's in free agency where Toronto is going to get appreciably better, especially, like, given rumors that their own guys, like, Camp wants $3 million plus. I love Camp. So do I, but you're not giving them $3 million bucks, man. You're just back into the Alex Kerfoot zone going, uh, man, if you couldn't pay, if, if everyone was upset about Kerfoot making 3-5, then people are going to be upset when David Camp makes $3 bucks and you and go, wait. 48 games out of goal. Sorry, you had 27 points this year? Yeah. And we give you $3 million? Like, yeah, I do other stuff. Yeah, well, you better do a lot of the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. You better have the Toronto Folding Maple, laundry you, the the Toronto Maple Leafs Twitter account better have like a comprehensive <laughs> breakdown ready. The, whoever the Justin Bourne video coach yeah. is. Better be cutting defensive highlights Just of him, watching him stick lifting checks, yeah. and stick checking and hitting guys, winning faceoffs. You got to have that ready to rock and roll. My my concern, my biggest concern with tree living is not his history at all. Mm. It's this, and I've said this on my own show that this Leafs job is the number one GM job in the NHL. Mm-hmm. So if you're Brad Tree Living, the job you've aspired to your entire life is to be a GM in the NHL and then to be it for the premier franchise in the league. Mm-hmm. He has that job. The only way to lose that quickly is to trade a star, Mm -hmm. get worse, miss the playoffs next year, and fired in two years. Okay, so I don't know If he does nothing, he gets to stay. But, okay, here's why I don't know if that's true. If he does nothing, right? Nothing nothing. means does his best to sign good players. They already have a good core. They probably finish with 96 points. I think they're going to take a step back in the regular season from where they were a year ago. Unless something happens, yeah. But, well, I just, I, I think Boston will, too. I think Boston will too. But listen, Tampa. Buffalo, Ottawa, Detroit yeah. will be better than they were last yeah. year. All three will. So they'll take a few more points off everyone. And I think Toronto's going to be worse too. People always looked at Boston and went, well, they're old and they're capped out. And Tampa, they're old and they're capped out. It's like Toronto is capped out as well. And yeah, it's going to be appreciably thinner. Like I mentioned, you know how many points they're losing in some of the forwards they had last year, not including Ryan O'Reilly and Noel Jari? is 143. Don't. Hmm. from their forwards like it's a lot that they've got to make up right now that's yeah. quite a bit and Achari and Ryan O'Reilly scored 15 percent of their goals in the playoffs so it's like where are you going to find all this scoring in the free agent market mm-hmm. I'm not seeing names that are there that are overly sexy and it's even the trade market you go well clearly they're not a team that should be in the market for Pierre-Luc Dubois right like that's not the I don't think that's the move for them personally I just think yeah. if your team has been flawed from a potential I don't want to say chemistry standpoint but a winning standpoint I don't know if bringing in Pierre Luc Dubois. He seems like a big baby. Yeah, exactly. Is the guy he finds, to be. He finds his way out of wherever he is, he, and, and and he just yeah seems like a finds the problem guy. We yeah. all have that person in our life yeah. where it's like they can have everything and they win whatever it is that they want to have, and then the, the day later they're like, nah, but. you know what else I don't have? And you're <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you just got the thing. Yeah. Be cool for like five minutes. I just yeah, Bunting, Engvall, Camp, Kerfoot, Ryan O'Reilly, Noel Lachari. It's just a lot of guys to be replacing. With free agency. Yeah. I, and AHL. Unless there's people in the minors that I'm not aware of. Like, people can reach out at any time. But from what I'm seeing, it looks like Pontus Holberg, Bobby McMahon, and Nick Robertson are the, the three guys that are very much next man up. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to picture what the playoffs would have looked like with them instead of the guys. The bottom six in the playoffs was really good. Yeah. I, I agree. And yeah. I don't think that they can bring really... How many of those guys can they bring back? Maybe Achari? That's the yeah. top priority and guy? And to be honest, I am less excited about that than other people. I like Noel Achari. Great so player. So do I, but I don't know? like him as your third-line center nah, that you paid $3 million he's to. already not fast and getting, you know, older. And, yeah, mm-hmm. I just, I don't know. Tavares is going to be a little slower. If you want to bring Eric O'Reilly, he's not getting faster. Like, there were times in the playoffs you're like, oh, are we the slow team? Mm-hmm. Like, when did that happen? And I worry about that. I just, I think that we've gotten to a place where it's Kerfoot fast, Engvall yes. fast, Sandine could skate. Like, you lose some speed here. You need some people who can skate. And they did look slow at times, too, with Ryan O'Reilly and Achari. Like, there were moments yeah. where the team looked old and slow. Tavares would be out there. They would get hemmed in their own end when they would try to put Tavares yeah. and O'Reilly together at times. And you would go, boy, those guys look like they're stuck in mud. It's probably the strongest case. As much as I love Ryan O'Reilly on the right team, yeah. you can't re-sign him because you do have Tavares. And the idea of having those guys on long-term deals together, well, I guess Tavares is only two more this season. It just that one doesn't work for me. I'm just, I, I'm trying to solicit from people now. Like, truly, if you don't think that, like, if you're in the camp of you cannot trade a core four member, right? Like, you're there. 
present to me the other solutions I've for rounding up. I've never met that person yet, by the way. Okay. I, I know they're online. Yeah, I know. I was going to yeah. say, yeah, privately, I don't think you meet that person, but it's yeah. very much discourse online. Yeah. But I do think that even in the, uh, the writing that I'm seeing kind of around hockey, you don't see the Leafs guys in trade bait columns. Which, because fairly enough, I don't think that they're actively being shopped and it's mm-hmm. a situation where it's a crisis point where you're going, hey, you got to have one of these guys off the books. But I do look at it and go, all right, what, what's the other option? You've got Lilligren, you've got a first round pick, you've got Nick Robertson. Those are your best three trade assets. You're going to move TJ Brody? Are you going to try to move McCabe at the $2 million and see? No, they're both cheap and good. But that's, that's what I mean. You can't, you're yeah. not moving Morgan Riley, not after that playoff run that you have. So, like, how are you appreciably changing your blue line without just kind of bumping someone down? The beauty of I Jake guess McCabe, you got to sign Orlov. You got to win that betting <sighs> war. That's a lot of money for Orlov. And now you're talking about your salary cap where it was like oh, 50% yeah. were these four guys. And yeah. now you're adding six. And that team identity I talked about goes away. I just, I want to spread the wealth around, man. I want to see this team have just a little bit more depth. I want to mm-hmm. see them be able to score. I agree with you that the blue line needs addressing. I just think like to fill out six forwards potentially and fine, give Pontus a spot, whatever, five forwards or I like, one, I like four McMahon forwards. and Holmberg in the regular season next year. We'll mm. see how, how they perform, but I bet you, you got to have a couple guys who make 800. Like that's just, yeah, you know, that's yeah, just, sure. That is just, they're going to be in. I just, yeah, Bobby McMahon is a 27-year-old guy who, yeah, whatever, fine. I kind of liked his moments for a second, but then as he played more games, it was kind of a, all right, I see. Can I tell you what I I heard? That doesn't do my gets more scoring part of the forward equation fixed. Can I tell you what I heard about Holmberg as a a guy? So have you ever, he was explained to me as he's great as a guest in your house. You don't want him in his own house. What that means is like when Uh he comes to the Leafs, and he hangs up his coat and he puts yeah. his shoes by the door and he minds his P's and Q's, does everything right. You love him. Mm-hmm. But then he gets comfortable after a while and he starts throwing his coat on the, the coat on the back of the couch and, you know, the shoes stay on in the house and all of a sudden you're a little bit less impressed. Mm. That's – he went down to the Marlies after beating with the Leafs and you never saw him again. A little comfy down there, mm-hmm. right? Like a little bit not on his P's and Q's. Like if he does – so my point is if he's a full-time guy – if he's on his best behavior and does everything great, you might like him. He might be a fourth line guy for you next year. Mm-hmm. Can you keep him acting like he's a guest in the house and not getting too comfortable? Buddy, it's not a report I love to hear. <laughs> Got to say, that's not the that's not a strong endorsement for this guy for me saying give him a spot. But I think that if you're talking about the most likely guy to be the fourth line center next year, mm-hmm. if there was a, you know, we went to Botano right now, we tried to throw up odds for who's going to start the year as the fourth line center. I think Pontus Holmberg, especially oh, yeah. out of those He's three guys that I mentioned, 300. McMahon, Holmberg, and uh, Nick Robertson, who starts the year with the Leafs. The, he's the far, far, far and away front runner. Yeah, he had a great run with the Leafs. He played 40 games last year, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, and he was solid to yeah. the point where, you know, again, I think, who was it that said he should get offer sheeted on your show, Kipper? Or was, was it? Yeah, it was it's Sam. All, I couldn't remember. It was one of those two guys that was like, <laughs> could he get an offer sheet? I was like, it's quiet on the offer sheet front for <laughs> Pontus Holmberg. After these 30 days. games yeah, in the American like, League. Yeah, it's not a lot of guys throwing offer sheets at him. I just, I, I think that the Leafs need to figure out how to get more scoring throughout their lineup. And the way for them to do that is by trading one of those guys. Yeah. And you just have to accept that as much as the optics are going to look bad in the moment, you're not going to get a player that's as good as William Nylander. You're not no. going to get a player that's as good as Mitch Marner. You in a, in a perfect world with no salary cap, of course you wouldn't trade either of those guys and you would just continue to spend money around them and roll year after year after year. But at this point with this inflection where they, these guys are, I, when Do you, you want said, to know what's going to happen? Do you want me to check the back of the textbook and read you the answer of what's going to happen? They're going to run them all back? They're going to trade Nylander in like November or something or uh, later in the season. In season. Yeah, I think that – I don't think he wants to rush anything. I don't Ooh, think he's going to come out know. and trade Austin Matthews. I think we would have heard by now. No, Matthews is not – I, th- I think he must be signing. We haven't he heard is. anything. Yeah, That's like Elliot had the report. Yeah, okay. Um you know, Nylander, his 10 ch- uh, team no trade list is, I believe, 10 teams he can't get traded to. Mm-hmm. It's not that he's selected 10 teams to be traded to, which still would leave yeah. 22 teams for them to trade him to. So the urgency on Nylander, I don't think, is quite the rush that people think it is. And I think, But if you're negotiating in good faith with a long-term contract with him right now, which yeah. even makes him more desirable to another team, yeah. I do think that complicates things in terms of just your... Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. standing with the players and with the league. If all of a sudden you're like, Nylander, we want to get you done, take a little less, and then all of a sudden, three months later, you're traded to a city you don't want to be playing in. Right, so he probably would have some protection on That's what I mean. Than, yeah. But I do think that 
you know, anyone trading for Nylander now is probably a good team. They're mm -hmm. trying to be competitive, and Nylander probably doesn't have them on their list anyway. I just think a Nylander trade isn't as urgent as July 1st mm -hmm. as the no trade kicking in. I agree with that, but some part of me also wonders if this is the week. I also, yeah. if I personally want it to happen as soon as possible, because yeah. it feels like every year Nylander's contract went into the season, then he was a dog the rest of the way, or Marner's contract went in, then he struggled that year. Like, I just want them to have their team in training camp. Mm -hmm. You know what is a, my recent example is Yusei Kikuchi goes into camp and has to earn a job as a pitcher for the Blue Jays in training mm -hmm. camp when he pitched a bajillion innings in yeah. preseason, and all of a sudden he's fantastic. You know, like, I feel like I want this, this Leafs team to have an idea who they are in September. I don't want them to go into it and figure it out and maybe we'll make moves or we'll add what we'll add at the deadline. You know, this team was still trying to find themselves mm -hmm. come playoffs after all the moves. They had what they had six players in March this past year. No. Yeah, dude, it was insane. They changed up their, basically yeah. their entire would team. like to see them sorted out sooner. So this is, this is the next part of it. Matthews has to get done before Nylander. Okay. But I, I've been thinking a lot about him too. And you and I have talked about him and I, I took a lot of crap on social, like or actually it was just YouTube. So I shouldn't even care. Because I shouldn't have even looked at YouTube comments, but I happen to, you know, graze them. Who are you people? Ah, God, <laughs> you're so mad on YouTube. But I'm just making this point about how I don't think that there's been a star like Austin Matthews before, right? Someone who has wanted the money, the term, the in line. In the mates. NHL. Yes. Yeah, say it's all over other leagues. No, no, no. In the NHL. He wants the money. He wants the term. He wants the, the place that he wants to play, which is clearly he does want to play here in Toronto. He wants his line mates. You know, he wants the accolades. And then he seemingly doesn't want any of the media attention or scrutiny that comes with the other stuff. He seems good at like deflecting it, but he also doesn't, I wouldn't say that he's Mr. Like you feel as though he's the most accountable fella on planet earth. Um, I've always wanted more from him as a leader. I've always wanted a little bit more mm -hmm. bite come playoff time. I've accepted who he is. It's funny. I like him in, in interviews a lot after games, but in game, you don't see what you're talking yeah, about. As much. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, I feel like so much of this off season just comes down to if he signs the McKinnon percentage, mm -hmm. like if he just even signs the McKinnon percentage and says, you know what guys, I'll take 13 million or whatever between yeah. 13 and 13, five. Yeah. And I want to be a Toronto Maple Leaf. I don't even care if it's the term because the term is fine. Let him sign for five years. I don't really care if you get Austin Matthews five versus eight, because the window is clearly right now. And then you can worry Would about that down the line. You? Uh, yeah, three would kind of bother me. Three would be kind of like, oh, okay, so you're here's why three would bother me is because it doesn't show any real commitment to the long term health yeah. of the franchise. My point here is that I feel like as much of this is an inflection point on the Maple Leafs, what I mentioned with the core four, a lot of it is going to be also on Austin Matthews to step mm -hmm. up and say, hey, I know I've gotten everything before, and I know it sucks that we're in a league where the star player has to end up not doing what is most prudent for his financial future. Yeah, but it's like. Man, if he goes up closer to 15 million, if he takes more of the salary cap percentage yeah. than Nathan McKinnon got, yeah. if he really forces their hand to give him all of the money and none of the term and even like capitulates on the one extra year, I I'm really troubled by that. Okay. We were talking about Matthews and Joe Bo doing his research. That's me. So this is all on Joe. So if some cap nerd comes at you, if I get a Myrtle text later <laughs> going, Joe actually doesn't know what he's talking about. With well, the I'm cap. looking at cap I like friendly. that you said some cap nerd, then Myrtle. So just so you know, James, that's how you view here. 100%. 100%. Do you know that? Like, I, I think I've sent him texts before going, hey, cap nerd, how does this work? <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I'm pretty right. sure. I've I'm not been hiding. No, the, uh, I, yeah. that's uh, very, very uh, upfront with our friendship. He's going to be on later this week, by the way. Uh, after the Leafs end up doing their draft and hopefully some moves. Okay, so Jobo says if Matthews takes the McKinnon money, that is 12-7. Yeah, so McKinnon signed his deal. Yeah. Uh, and at the time it was signed, it was 15.27% of that cap. Yep. And assuming so the cap right now, 83.5. If Matthews signs that exact number, it would come out to $12.7 million. So I think, Highest paid player in the league. Yeah, guess what? Matthews, be the highest paid player in the league, but don't break the barrier for percentages make a statement that you care more about winning than anything else. Like yeah. that's what I think is important for him. And I know people, it's the easiest take to criticize, right? Because you say in your own life, don't you want the most money? Mm -hmm. Can't you try to want the most money and win? Why should he take less? Why shouldn't it be someone else that takes less rounds? Austin Matthews. Don't compare what he makes to what I make. <laughs> no, exactly. He's living in a different world exactly. than we are. He's yeah. already on his third contract. Yeah, he's made like 60 million. Why don't we it? third contract? Yeah. Okay, he's already gotten it. He has the individual award, right? The guy has a heart trophy across from Connor McDavid. 
That's a pretty awesome thing to have. Yeah. He's got his Rocket Richard. He's got two. He's he's got people going, man, you're you're one of the best American born players that's ever lived. But, and he probably bought real estate in Toronto in like twenty eighteen or something. Yes. He's living. <laughs> Do you know what though? And this is so stupid and I hate it because I think the hockey hall of fame is completely broken, flawed, and run by some people with some agendas that just they will not reveal to the public. Yeah. The secret society that decides some Stanley sense. Cup winners are worth less. Some stats are worth more. Sometimes wins are relevant. Sometimes wins aren't relevant. Whatever. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mystery, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But if I'm Austin Matthews, I'm going, so wait, why did those guys not get in? So what was the thing with Jeremy Roenick, the other great American-born player? Like, we know it's other stuff. But it's going, oh, yeah, you got to put some rings. You want to be one of the all-time greats, you got to win. And for them, I think that there has to be some ownership with him where he goes, okay, this is my team. I'm re-signing here. This is my team. There's no conversation about me moving. Maybe Marner gets traded. Maybe Nylander gets traded. Like, that's the business. Somebody might end up moving here. Mm-hmm. We're two years away from Tavares being gone. Maybe even less, right? Because when he's the expiring deal, who knows? Maybe the Leafs actually do say, we'll eat a bunch of this money for one year. We're moving off of the contract. He can go play somewhere else. Tavares knows, hey, we're not re-signing you. Maybe we trade you. You go somewhere else. Who knows? It's like it's easier to think about getting off of one year of money versus two. Right. Especially when this year, like I mentioned, the center market is what it is. And yeah. we're probably overstating a little bit the, you know, demise of John Tavares, the point right. of game player. Just like a little, just a touch. If I'm him. I'm living in the gym this summer. Yeah, but he, I think he lived in the gym last summer. And yeah. okay. guess what? He's John Tavares. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that he's had a lot of not living in the right, gym summers. That's not really his MO. Right. I think Matthews has to make that statement. He has to go out and go, okay, it's 12.75. That's McKinnon money. Then I'm taking 12.75. I'm mm-hmm. not taking over 13. Mm-hmm. Like if, he, if he takes over that money, I feel like the culture is set, which is you go, this is about this. The Toronto Maple Leafs go are still yours. about player empowerment and getting yours. And if you're everyone else, and the problem I've always had with that is I don't get how, if you're coming to the Maple Leafs and you're feeling like a member of the quote unquote team, that it doesn't feel like, a class system in a way that is different. What do we say about yeah. the great winners too, right? Is that it's always like they praise their other teammates. They make it feel like everyone is kind of an equal part. Look at even with Vegas. I know I said, don't take no, too no, much no. from them, but Phil Kessel yeah. gets bumped off the roster and he's just sitting there supporting his teammates. He's at all the Stanley Cup. They love the guy to death. Mm-hmm. There was a camaraderie through their roster that you really feel when Matthews leaves, he takes, you know, Freddie Anderson or one of the other guys to, Arizona with him. He's friends with Bieber. Uh, like, you know, he was friends with uh, Tyson Berry. Um, I know Marner and he are close. But it's like, I want to start to feel the different leader. Close. I, don't I just want to yeah. see the different leadership component. I think that maybe, okay, if you're the cool guy in the dressing room, that's fine. If you're the guy that inspires the most confidence through the goal scoring, that's fine. But I, I, I want to see you take that step in your career, the Sidney Crosby step, the, the great leader step of just like, yeah. hey, hockey is a team sport. I know that I need a better team around me. I know we can't accomplish that as easily if I'm taking $14 million. There is no doubt that the number he takes will influence how he's viewed by the general public. And like more than ever these days, we view athletes by through the lens of their contract. And mm-hmm. particularly in hockey, when the salary cap has been flat for so long, that's gotten much worse, not better. Yep. And yeah, it'll affect how I feel about him. Like yep. uh, it'll it'll show us what his priorities are. I wouldn't blame him for signing a short deal, you know, and saying, okay, if Neither the cap, people are saying the cap's going to be a hundred million in like four years, you know, like soon. So like, then fine. Sign, sign for right. five years. Five is think is the, the fewest years he can sign again. Yeah. I, I, it's, you know, this is exactly why he's going to sign four, four <clears> times <throat> a number that makes you mildly uncomfortable, but isn't four times 13, nine or something. You're like, well, I guess he could have got more, but I guess he didn't really take it. I don't know. You know, like 25 just, years old and he's signing his third contract. Like I just, he, he has made $52.9 million. Already. That, that's what I'm saying. And, and he's it, not been paying daycare costs. I can tell you that. And he wants to live in Arizona where it's not exactly the hardest place to get real estate. Dude. Like, I look back at some of the places I could have had when I lived there. Oh yeah. You're kind of dumb. Give them away. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they do. The place, there's like a five bedroom place. You in the back pool. There's like 200 Born, grand. Born was like <laughs> his, in his book. He's like, and I was living in Arizona having the time. I'm of my life with my wife, but then I wanted to blog about hockey and I blew up my entire life for that. I was like, what? Well <laughs> it's the most confusing part of the book. Just like, like, yeah. Did I tear pages yeah. out? What did I miss here? Yeah, no. It's like, where's the gap? What, what was happening here? She's just having fun in Arizona in the sun, having I a perfect know. life golfing all the time. But no. This is Matthews. And yeah. so it's going to be, it's going to tell us a lot about what his priorities are. And I also think that 
having the public goodwill is worth a lot of money too. I agree, man. You know, over the course of your career and sponsorships and post career and all that. So, you know, if I'm tree living, I'm like, look, we had an Austin Austin pizza sign last mm-hmm. year in playoffs. You guys remember the Austin pizza yeah. sign on the yeah. thing? It's a big billboard on the He's, side of the QW. Yeah, it's like yeah. we we could you know, make things happen for you eventually. We can't right now, but let's, Dude, we'll talk later. The money quotient of this, it's it's almost frustrating to think about because it's like, yeah, man, you can make this up, right? Like this is this is something that you're going to be fine. I've seen my dad and my father in law. The money yeah. they get offered to do certain things, and it's like they're who they are. Austin yeah. Matthews is another tier. The thing is, of he dollars. clearly, you know, he just wants to be able to do his own thing and not be a part of that stuff. But I would say that for Matthews, like even for your celebrity status, Austin, you know, it's going to do better for you. If you end up winning, like if you go on a deep Stanley cup playoff run, you don't think that's going to do well in terms of having the coverage South of the border. And all of a sudden you're doing the Charles Barkley interview. Like, honestly, I wonder if he watched to Kachuk do the Charles Barkley TNT interview. And he went, that's actually what I'm most jealous of. <laughs> <That's better than laughs> like, yeah, it's like, I, oh God, other than that, like, it's close. You know, it could have been on, on TNT. Yeah. I love that stuff. I just, I think that the implication through the rest of the roster and where the Maple Leafs are at is going to be so determined by that number. Yeah. And that's why right now this week, to me, it feels a little bit, you know, you, you used non-urgent with Nylander. I feel like this week is just a little bit urgent because if you come out of this draft and you've made that pick, yeah. then that's your player. You're not, no one's trading for that mm-hmm. guy. Like, unless you're already actively picking for another team and then they've got you over a barrel. Cause they've got like, if you're trading that pick, it's happening this week. Mm-hmm. So a move of consequence should necessarily like could be coming here right now. One thing that does interest me about trading that pick is uh-huh. that I think there's some conflict with the way the the organization is right now. Like, you know, Kyle Dubas left to Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. hasn't hired his GM yet. Some people have speculated it's Brandon Pridham, who Brandon, Brandon Shanahan was like, well, Pridham's here. He's going to run the draft. And then Wes mm-hmm. Clark is the head scout who is a Dubas guy and has followed him wherever he's been. So the two people running the draft are kind of Dubas guys and mm-hmm. they've done Dubas like scouting, right? For his type of players. Dude, maybe, you go, weird. maybe you go, I'm not sure what everyone thinks and where everyone's going, whatever. Maybe we just trade this pick and get a guy we know we like rather than mm-hmm. kind of, the, it's a complicated year for the, for the draft for the least. No, I completely agree. And it's especially complicated by the fact that their general manager isn't even at the table. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's more incentive no, to be like, we're just not going to pick anyone. No, that's it. Move, <laughs> you know? Moving the pick. The, I guess the only point of frustration with it is as much as people went, who cares about the picks, who cares about the picks and all these Dubas trades. This it's one of the funniest things about Dubas being gone and the Dubas sites just, you know, f- still going, how could this happen? It was never Kyle Dubas. It was always Brendan Shanahan blocking his moves and everything would have worked out fine. If he was the general manager still, it's like, you look at it and it's like, you got four guys tied to huge money. You've got no one else signed to essentially the roster. You've got a blue line that everyone ag- agrees is kind of unacceptable. And you have to move off the Matt Murray money. And oh, by the way, there's yeah, no not, picks. there's no picks anywhere in the next three years. And we're like, this is cost he's the best in. general manager who ever lived. It's like, what? It's the cost <laughs> How much of going all they in, man? They've done it four years in a That's, row. Of course. And, it, I again, I liked the deadline moves. Yeah. I liked the shots he took. I think it's retroactively, just, if you look back at his tenure, the thing we'll regret the most, you know, we, he would he, regret the most is like, uh, you know, Hyman leaves for nothing and Brown one, leaves yeah. for nothing and McKayev leaves for nothing. And all of a sudden you're well, like, Brown, they had to trade, right? They yeah. threw him in the Zaitsev get off the money contract, right. but still he was probably the wrong guy that they ended up giving up on at the wrong time. Yeah. The, the people, valuable assets leaving for nothing when you don't win that yeah. hurts. Even so there's a retroactive one with Andreas Janssen where people go, well, he sucked anyway too. It's like, yeah, he did end up sucking, but, but he, he had, had value. real value. Yeah. Like you turned him into nothing. You turned yeah. Kapanen into a first round pick. That was bad luck. Yeah. But yeah, because Rodion Amarov being sick, like, that's just, you know, awful for him right. and a bad bounce for the organization. Terrible. But, like, yeah, man, it's just there's not exactly much here. This is why, again, core four. But anyway, Matthews has to take less. That's just, like, my biggest thing is yeah. that has to – and it, it can't even – they've got What's to – What's the Gritano line on his number? What do you think they set it at? Oh, dude, I think he's going to take and 13 half? and a half plus. And I think he's going to take – like, this is what your point that's so frustrating with it. I think he's going to take a contract that some people will be able to defend because they're going to go, well, he didn't take 15. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, because he would have been a war criminal to take 15. (laughs) They would have had to try him in the hag and go, you know what? You've really done. So he'll still end up getting, you know, a short-term deal, more percentage than McKinnon. And that's that's why I agree with you about the public perception is worth something. It's like, you know, I was watching Marcia So on Spit and Chicklets, and he essentially reiterated something we all talk about, but it was what I mentioned after Vegas. I said... My take after the cup was Vegas is a chance to establish kind of what heat culture has. 
which is the the team that's just like always running a competitive group because they can have the nightlife, actually some halfway decent fans when yeah. the team is hot. Like the building gets cool whenever yeah. you're actually winning. You're living in a state with no tax. You're living in a state with golf. You're living in a state where there's a lot of access to, cool place to be. like women. Celebrities everywhere. Celebrities come through and then, oh yeah, um, you can buy a big old house and have all the amenities that you want. Also, Vegas is kind of like central. You can fly to LA pretty quickly. It's not the worst flight back if you want to come to North. And like also, Vegas East. outside the Strip is kind of a quiet place. Yes, exactly. It's not bad. No. And Marsh is so, but he did mention, he's like, hey, the guy, they, people don't rip you if you don't score for five games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, well, if you're Matthews, I don't know how much you care about that, but setting the tone for the even the other guys that do come in here going, hey, we're going to take a little less to win, like even just a small percentage, that's all mm-hmm. it takes. Small percentages can add up for this thing in terms of the player you get. It's the difference between you having to trade away Connor Brown versus you going, you know what? We can find another way to make this work. Mm-hmm. Like it is. And is so UFA, by the way. What? Brown's a UFA. I know he is, but it just feels like he's actually going to have a real enough market. Yeah. Like everyone's in the market for a Connor Brown. So true. Yeah. And so like oh, maybe. Oh, the passionate guy who works hard with finishing touch? Yeah, I know. Exactly. But he's, <laughs> and they're like, he's coming off the injury. You're like, yeah, the injury that most guys come back from, no sweat. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's ACL and hockey. Like, he'll be fine. Uh, he's still in his 20s. Anyway, I just think like, yeah, he's got. He's got to show the rest of the organization that this is the priority. And that I think that that's going to have a ripple effect in terms of the culture shift. Yeah. And it would also behoove them, I think, if he does get this done soon. I, that like, would be, I, I do too. Just take the drama off it. And that's what I'm talking about. Have yeah. it ready by September. Have it, have it, know what the team is. Well, dude, there's never, like, if we're doing the never star thing too, I don't want to say this one because there's definitely been complicated stars in the league in terms of the way their markets feel about them. But Matthews is definitely a very unique guy in that he's got those accolades and he has been so popular here. Mm-hmm. And yet right now, the way it feels is like it's it's okay. Toronto has basically had no star players throughout the course of their history since 67, yeah. right? Like they had they Doug Gilmore was a very good player. You'd think Doug Gilmore played here for 20 years, you know, and like, mm-hmm. you know, had an insane amount of seasons. It's like, nope. <laughs> Matt Sundin is the best leaf that they've had, right? Yeah. He's got all the accomplishments, all the accolades are of like individual stats and you go, yeah, man, Matt Sundin. I love, he's one of my favorite players ever, right? Like boyhood yeah. uh, kind of hero ish figure, you know, he's what? And the greatest players to ever play the game. I don't know. 75th. I have no yeah, idea. Just, yeah. I, I wouldn't put him that low. I was like, don't <laughs> 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 you talk, talk. You're like <laughs> Jeff Barrett over here. Where you're like, you got to put New Zealand on to add him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, no, no, but I, he's just, yeah. Like it's Matt Sundin for yeah. an original six franchise to have him be your greatest player. Yeah. And now Matthews is on track to be that with a bullet, essentially like most talented, yeah. no question. And yet here's this organization that has been starved for stars that has been desperate for a player like this. And I do think that there's a, what, 25, 30% portion of the fan base that would go, I don't care if they trade him. Yeah. Like that's where he's got people and he can either internalize that as like, Oh, this market stinks and everybody here is a crybaby, and I've won all these things and I've scored all these goals. Or he can go, you know what? I, I've got to be the one that you changes know, this perception. It's, the, it's that element where if you're in a relationship where you feel like you're constantly begging the other person to like you and show affection and stay around, you're probably just better off without that person. That's how it feels with Matthews, where it's like, you still like us, right? We're still yeah. friends, right? Like, are you mad at me? Like, yeah. what? we're good. We're still like it. We're fine. Yeah. You know, like it doesn't feel healthy to have to chase to this degree. I know. So man. it would be nice to get a little bit of term a little bit of you would like you'd like him to show us that can you, get on the knee can you show <laughs> give us, us a ring that you love the people give us a literal back. ring give people back yes exactly a little bit of love